now I'm going to give you an interrogation lesson. Right here is where I would lean into her. When she said they found nothing on me, I'd say, wow, you, you had your stuff together. And I would then start to do kind of a P and E up about, yeah, you're telling the truth and, 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 and then I would start criticizing and needling her story because narcissists can't let you needle them. Once they think you like them, then you turn on them and you start needling them. They'll correct you every time. Well, I sure miss Chase. Yep. <laughs> well, where do you think he went? I think he's going to kill something. <laughs> Probably. He's dressed for it. There uh, it is. Good job. It's cool there as it is here, and you need that today. It's not Toronto cold, but it's miserable here. It's our very own polka piano accordion player, <laughs> Chase Hughes. <laughs> Just got work on the German accent slightly. Uh, the, See, I wish I could do a German right. accent. The the English idea of a German accent has always been influenced by, uh, you know, post-war movies. So for us, all the Germans are, you know, slightly... Uh... <laughs> okay, ready? Here we go. I'm Scott Rasmo, body language expert and analyst. I trained law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a behavioral expert. I train intelligence agencies the general public in behavioral profiling, persuasion, and influence, and also teach interrogation to different members of Uncle Sam and other countries. And I just released this book this week. I'm the author of this six-minute x-ray book. Just came out. Pretty excited about that. Rapid behavior profiling. Greg. I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America and have this number one online body language course with Scott, bodylanguagetactics.com. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Rebecca Fenton. Rebecca Fenton uh, is accused of shooting her husband. Well, she's been convicted of it. And she's in prison. We know uh, we've got a pretty good idea that, that she shot her husband. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're not going to be talking about the, the, uh, everything going on around it. We're not going to talk about the court case. We're not going to be talking about anything like that. Nothing but her body language and what she talks about in the 911 call. So those are the things we cover. We don't get into the case and the history of everything. We don't care. We're just interested in what she's doing with her body language. And we just tell you what we see. We're not for her being innocent or for her being guilty. We're just telling you what we see. We're looking at the body language and listen to what she says. And we're telling you what we see in that and what we hear in that. We're telling you about that. Anybody got anything else? Yeah, no, I think we were going to look at body language and behavior. And guys, if you want to know more about her, there's a ton about her you can go find online. This is a, a really well-known case and settled. Yeah. Yeah, one more thing. So check out Piers Morgan, who is interviewing her here. You'll probably know Piers Morgan from America's Got Talent, The Celebrity uh, Apprentice. He was also at the age of 29, the editor of Rupert Murdoch's The News of the World. So he's really seen a lot of people and he's been around and he's he's seen a lot of stuff. He actually said of Rebecca Fenton, she is the best liar I've ever seen. And he said he finds that fascinating. So if Piers thinks this is the best liar he's ever seen. Like, he's seen a lot of liars in his time, believe me. And he's been a naughty boy himself now and again as well. And I think he'd admit to that. So uh, so check out Piers and also check out Rebecca Fenton, the, the, the best liar he's ever seen. Awesome. All right, let's take a look at the first video. Tell me in your words what happened. Uh, Larry was home. He was watching Tiger Woods and then was going to take a nap and watch the Super Bowl later on that evening. I checked on him to see if he needed anything. He said that we would order a pizza later, and I went back out to the gym. The last thing that my husband said to me was, I love you. I had the music blaring and was working out. Um, I walked into my house at approximately 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon. And I found my husband in a pool of blood. I've never seen so much blood in my life. And I could see from where I was standing that my house had been ransacked. 
I didn't know if Larry had fallen down the stairs, if Larry had been shot, if Larry had been stabbed. I had no idea what had happened. But um, I frantically tried to take his pulse and then ran outside to call 911. I thought my husband was still alive because his eyes were open. And I told him to hold on. My world has not been the same since. And nothing has made much sense for me since that time. But the police seem pretty certain that you were the killer, that you cold-bloodedly took a gun and pumped five bullets into your husband until he was dead. That's what they believe. Yeah. All right, Chase, what do you got? We definitely see a lot here. One thing we're going to start seeing a lot of that you're seeing in this video is her nodding for the other person to nod. She's wanting Pierce to start nodding. She's asking for approval and he's not doing it. And you'll notice that in these other videos, but she's only nodding during the times when she's offering up a piece of evidence that makes her innocent. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And she also has an upward tone when she's saying something and asking you to agree with it at the times when she's presenting that evidence. And more than 50% of the time, she'll also include an eyebrow flash with that nod to make sure that you do the same, that you follow along with that behavior. There was, when Pierce is offering up this accusation that police are saying, that you shot this person in cold blood, walking through that. We see emotional accessing down here with the eyes, followed by a distance. There's a stare. There's a slight head shake. And there is, it's followed by a tiny swallow right at the end of this clip. In, in my line of work, in 20 years of doing this stuff, I see a lot, a lot of this. And this is called dissociation. So I think we're going to start seeing a pattern here of a person, uh, the behaviors of a person who has experienced a lot of dissociation. And especially with things that she's been through in her past, the things she's done in her past, dissociation may be par for the course for her childhood and probably much of her adult life. And there's two types of association, dissociation. I'll just cover really quick. There's depersonalization and there's derealization. Depersonalization means that this isn't me doing this. this. These hands were not mine that did this. And there's derealization, which means the world isn't real. The situation is fake. I don't feel like I'm in a real situation. The the derealization tends to lead to antisocial behavior, which this woman is social. She's able to do the facial expressions. She makes good, well, good conversation. I say that, you know, with all the slack I can give it. The depersonalization part of it to where the person is detached from self is more likely to lead into higher social development. So they're the ones that are likely to be what we're seeing here. So I think she is a depersonalization person. And what I mean by dissociation is that, especially in kids in their childhood, when they're undergoing, uh, if they undergo some kind of severe trauma or even light trauma in many cases, they detach from the present moment. And grownups who have been doing this for a long time, this muscle tends to strengthen over time. And they find that it's easier to do things way outside of their normal comfort zone because they can dissociate from the action. And I think there may be some stuff we're about to see that's going to bring this up again. And I apologize for the long explanation. I'll pass it to you, Greg. Yeah. So a couple of things. Her down left eye movement. I'm going to give you what this is in you. Her down left eye movement is her navigating the minefield. She's walking through an internal conversation about what she's thinking. Try this at home. You 
try to calculate 15% of 980 without rounding. And you're going to find first, you'll try to look up to your left a little, that won't work. And you'll drop down into your lower left as you're rifling through trying to figure out an actual internal conversation with self. You see, you're doing that a lot in this video. When I ask a question, I don't expect a person to do that because they're figuring out how to answer is what it is. She also is starting to tell a narrative. They're structured her story. She's starting off and Mark, I'm going to not steal much here because I know you're going to have a lot around storytelling. And she's starting to build story structure she can later use. If I were interrogating her, he missed one opportunity here that I would say. She said words that leave a glaring hole in her story for me. And she says, he was taking, he was watching Tiger Woods and then was going to take a nap. Hmm, there's a weird tense change for you. So, okay, maybe that's the way she's remembering it. I would have said, exactly what was he watching Tiger Woods? Because I can verify that on TV. I can tell what was going on at that point. But the end, then he was going to take a nap. I would venture to say somewhere in there, there's a problem. It's the only time I hear her use that word pattern in her entire story. And Joe Navarre and Jack Schaefer call that verbal bridging. I call it time hiding, whatever you want to call it. I'd say they coined the phrase verbal bridging. There's that. She does that lilt at almost every opportunity that she tells you something. That lilting, my house is ransacked. The other thing is when people make their living using their face, when people smile a lot, it leaves residuals. When people have a train wreck of stuff on their face, it's because they do a lot of train wreck stuff with their face. I can just about guarantee you there's some intensity in this person we're not seeing in this interview. And all the etching or residuals that you're seeing or all those years of her scrunching up her head and doing whatever she does. I would venture to say an argument with her is a very hot argument just by looking at her face. Um, look at mine. You can tell I've been kind of a jerk to people in my life. So if I've got this and she's got that, that's a pretty bad indicator. Um, and then finally, if you listen to her, you'll find she does a great, great grief. She engages the chin in her forehead, but we don't know why. Guys, there's no indicator of deception. There's no single indicator. It just makes us know what to ask next. But she tongue juts in the middle of that. And this is not a grooming move. This is a full-on tongue jut. I mean, it sticks out. And then last one I'll leave you with, and you watch from here on, 21 first-person pronouns. She's talking about her husband. He gets about 11. That's what I got. Scott, what do you got? All right. Let's talk about some of the things she said and the way she looked when she said them. When she's talking about the last words her husband told her, he said, the last thing my husband said was, I love you. She doesn't show any emotion in that. When I tell you guys, when I, when I put my dog, Albert, when we had to go put him to sleep, I know what time it was. I know exactly what my face was doing. And, it, and even though a little time has passed since then, when I'm, when I'm not in this situation, I'm explaining to someone, my face isn't going to look like it does now. It's going to be a little bit more emotional than this. Her face, she's talking about her husband, the guy that she was supposed to be the, the, uh, the soulmate with. She shows no emotion at all in, in, that, in the direction of sadness or grief. She just said the last thing he said was, was I love me. He loves me. Also in this, the women watching this, they're going to say, why does this hit me wrong? Why does this sound, why is this odd? And they're going to feel it in their gut because what their brain has seen is this. They've seen an edit in, in that. He, that, that the last thing he said was that he loved me and she keeps talking wasn't part of that original question. Because if you'll listen to that, you'll hear him talking in the background. They've cut his mic so you don't hear him talking. They've, they've cut to her and you can hear his voice, the, the room sound of his voice bouncing off back there. And he's asking her something else. So, if there's a woman watching this and you go, why does that feel so weird that you didn't know what to look for or listen for? That's why it feels weird to you. I love um, those ears, Scott. I oh, didn't hear thanks. that. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. Well, then she get then she talks about this. She says, I came in approximately 4.35 o'clock. That's great because that gives her that 30 minute window to shoot this guy and clean everything up and do everything she needs to do to get ready to present this to the nine one to, to the, the, the dispatcher, to the nine one one operator. So you've got that amount of time and she makes sure to say it was, I don't know what time it was. In other words, it was approximately four thirty five o'clock. And I, and, and I was in the gym, you know, she says that, that she was in the gym and when she came back in, um, yeah, she said that the, I had the music blasting and I was working out. And that fits the alibi that goes with why she didn't hear the gunshots as well. 
Now, uh, in, in the full 911 call, we're not going to listen to the whole thing. She mentioned she was in the gym eight times. Eight times, she says, I was in the gym and I had just come back from the gym. I'd been in the gym. I just came in from the eight times. That's saying, if you're not talking about the person needing help and it, and that first first things out of your mouth, something's up. We're, we'll get to that when we get to the call. But that 30-minute window gives her enough time to get rid of all, to wipe things clean, to clean things up, clean herself up, and then get psyched up and make that phone call. So that's what I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So lots of good things set up here. Uh, absolutely concur with everything I've heard there. Listen out for those inflections, lots of upward inflections in this one, which often sound kind of uh, like requests for approval or that, it, that it, it might be a question, more of a statement later on. We will hear some downward inflections and they'll be around things that we actually know to be factual. So so let's point those out as we go along. Um uh, yeah, good point, Greg. You know, why was Tiger Woods on the television? Well, that was the Phoenix Open in Arizona, <laughs> apparently. And that's why Tiger Woods is on the TV. So does she mention Tiger Woods? Because she puts a big stress on Tiger Woods. Does she mention that because she's kind of a big golf fan and it really sticks in her mind? Or is it that Tiger Woods is not only an icon of golf, but an icon of infidelity? He is representative of both those things. And in fact, for many people, more of an icon of infidel uh, infidelity. And so now I've never, I've, I've never come across this story before, but the moment I heard that stress on Tiger Woods was the moment where I thought, we're going to hear about somebody being some, some infidelity a bit later on. I would gamble. So, so watch out for, for that. Uh, the last thing my husband said to me was, I love you, upward inflection. I think this is a resume statement. This is he told me he loves me, so, you know, we're in love, so well, why would I kill him? So it's already set up there. I kind of killed him because the last thing he said was, I love you, and therefore, you know, we must love each other back. Um, absolutely, request for approval all the way through. Now, responds with concern and confusion at the end, and absolutely, we've got grief muscles here and here, and it's, and it's really good. Like, it's it's... It's really good. I think when, when Piers Morgan says, this is a really good liar, yeah, this is really good stuff. She does it really, really well. And if it weren't for all these other things around it and, and what we're going to hear about, that signal alone would probably get most people. And they would feel immediate empathy around that grief. So, so as a first, um, first out of the gate here, uh, good performance, but with quite a few interesting tells in there about what we're going to see later on. That's what I got for you. Excellent. Tell me in your words what happened. Uh, Larry was home. He was watching Tiger Woods and then was going to take a nap and watch the Super Bowl later on that evening. I checked on him to see if he needed anything. He said that we would order a pizza later, and I went back out to the gym. The last thing that my husband said to me was, I love you. I had the music blaring and was working out. Um, I walked into my house at approximately 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon. And I found my husband in a pool of blood. I've never seen so much blood in my life. And I could see from where I was standing that my house had been ransacked. I didn't know if Larry had fallen down the stairs, if Larry had been shot, if Larry had been stabbed. I had no idea what had happened. But um, I frantically tried to take his pulse and then ran outside to call 911. I thought my husband was still alive because his eyes were open. And I told him to hold on. My world has not been the same since. And nothing has made much sense for me since that time. But the police seem pretty certain that you were the killer, that you cold-bloodedly took a gun and pumped five bullets into your husband until he was dead. That's what they believe. Yeah. All right, we good? Lovely. Let's move on. 
The police found the ransacking extremely suspect. That's what they said. They're putting it all together and it's an incredibly compelling case. If you were watching LA Law or something on TV, you would be convicting this person, almost certainly. Most people think you're guilty. Why should we believe that you're not? Because of the things that weren't looked at, um, I was convicted on absolutely no physical evidence whatsoever. They found fingerprints and footprints that were never matched to anybody that belonged to strangers. There was no DNA, no evidence on that firearm that resembled me at all. All right. I'm going to go first on this one. <laughs> so when, when he says, why should, I, why should we believe you? The answer is because I'm not a murderer. I wouldn't do something like that. I'm not that kind of person. I'm, that's not me. I don't do that. That's the answer you give. Not a long, drawn-out thing about evidence and these other things that go down to the, to the uh, analytical side of it. You're not there. You say, I'm not that kind of person. That's why I wouldn't do that. That's where you go with that. As we go through this, we see a, we see a picture of the bathroom. And we see pill bottles in the in the pill chest or whatever's been gone through the little where the behind the mirror, the, and the pill bottles are laying everywhere. That's not what happens when somebody goes through your your pill chest. When somebody breaks into your house to steal stuff, what they do is they go in the bedroom and they get your they'll get a pillowcase and they'll get a sheet or the top blanket off the bed and that's what they throw everything on and they wrap it up and they leave with that like Santa Claus. So those pills wouldn't be laying the floor. They're not pulling them out, looking at them. Oh, this is for sitting what I need. This isn't what I need. They go through and they just pull it all into a, to a pillowcase and they leave with that. That's why that's, they found that suspect. That's, that's what was wrong with that. Odd wording, odd wording. And this when she starts talking about the DNA. And I, and I know we, we all talked about this earlier and we all wanted to, we thought this was funny, which is there was no DNA. There was no evidence on that firearm. She never says gun. She says firearm. She's separating herself from, from the gun. Now, who calls it a firearm? Who talks like that? And then she says, uh, then she says, uh, no evidence on that firearm that resembled me at all. That's, that's, that's weird. That's weird. Again, she's separating herself that resembled me at all. Nothing on that gun that resembled me. I've never heard that before in my life. That is weird. That's weird to hear. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I think you're starting now to see a pattern. I think she started off telling a story and her pattern now is going to be an attorney. She is suddenly going to be, excuse my English, and you can bleep this a little bit if you want, in the Army, we would call that a house lawyer. And she's going to give everybody advice. She's going to know how this works. She'll shift gears and go into jargon. She'll speak legalese, something that's not real, but she feels like sounds real. It's like when people use the wrong pronouns because they're trying to be pretentious and they go, him and I or he and I at the inappropriate times. And you start to see that shift. She's trying to appear to be more presentable. And she's clearly aware that she may or may not be presentable at this point. He also, we don't have it in this video, but Piers Morgan made her cry because he said, your mother thinks you killed him. There's a pretty good indicator. Usually when your mother says, we, I think she might have done it. Um, she said, I had not looked. There was no physical evidence. That's what they said. You see, she's starting to distance from anything that has expertise or anything else. And I think she's creating a campaign here by saying there was, I agree with you, average people don't call guns firearms. Firearms are things cops call them or murder weapons or those kinds of things. And she's picking up on those words because she's trying to have credibility. When a person overextends himself into a new space, and maybe she does this all the time, it might be in her personality. But when a person overextends themselves into new language, Scott, you and I both know when people use medical jargon or legal jargon, what's that a red flag of? Psychopaths, they always want to blend in and fit, and they try to fit right in, in that business. So I'm not going to go any further than that. She's trying to create reasonable doubt in the legal term, like she's back at trial. That's what I think she's doing. So from that, Chase, what do you got? So there's one thing that every interrogator learns when you first start out, maybe your first day of class. A failure to make a strong positive denial is a gigantic red flag. I didn't do it. I don't care. I don't have to prove myself. I didn't do it. There's no possible way I would ever do something like this. That's a strong, confident, positive denial that I didn't, I didn't do this thing. 
And we see a chin thrust here, a, a nice big one, when he's starting to bring the topic up. And this is indicative of disdain or sometimes contempt. Uh, but it's, it's in the primate world, we, we are primates, uh, all primates will, will expose the neck to show that I'm, I'm not threatening. But this is also to challenge the other person out of anger. So you see, we see drunk idiots in a bar who are about to get into a fight. Their, their chin goes up, their arms come out. We see all these vital organs getting exposed to show I'm not, I'm not afraid of you. So we see that here. But there's two things here I want you to really pay attention to for the rest of this entire YouTube video. I want you to watch if somebody killed someone that's close to you, God forbid, you'd be really, really concerned about the perpetrator. You would talk about them. You would mention them when you wouldn't say, I don't know how the gun got in the car. You'd say, I don't know who put the gun in the car. The conversation would be about the perpetrator and not an action. And we'll, we'll uncover some more of this in just a minute. Mark. Yeah, so in our last video, what you'd have seen is plenty of chin down to, to chase his point. And so in this one, oh, and in the last one as well, as, as I think Scott was saying, uh, lots of mentions of herself, okay? In this video where Piers comes in and says, why should we... Uh, why should we believe you? He starts to put into question herself. And at that point, once herself is questioned, up comes the chin. And the response to that confrontation is, I would say, arrogance, which is to say, you cannot question me. I am untouchable. Here are my kill points. Yeah, you're not going to get me. It's it's an, and it's an extreme difference. I want you to go back and look at where the head is placed for the predominance of that first video and look where the head is placed on that second video and realize that the question is, why should we believe you and see what effect that has? Now, I even checked the camera angle to make sure the camera, as it came from Piers, didn't dip down that it might make it look like that. The, the camera, the, the person on the camera is getting exactly the same height, not gone underneath. So it's definitely a big display to that questioning that person around believability. I'll, I'll leave I, it at that. I think the two of you are on to something, the bar fight and the that's yeah. who you're seeing. That's a scrapper throwing their chin up prepared for what you're at. That's the reason the chin goes up with her. I, I yeah. have that in my notes. Yeah. Well, when arrogance we, happens, the person believes that they're untouchable. Yeah. It's basically the same. When you do it in close proximity, within striking distance, you're saying, I don't think you're going to attack. I don't think you've got it. I don't think you have anything. Yeah. And that's what's beautifully arrogant about it, especially when you've got somebody with power in front of you. And Piers has some power. She doesn't think he has any power. Yeah, we see that a couple of we we see that a couple of times uh, later on as well, in, yeah. in a couple of videos. So that's we'll 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 point those out that time too. Yes, I totally agree with you. Yeah. The police found the ransacking extremely suspect. That's what they said. They're putting it all together, and it's an incredibly compelling case. If you were watching L.A. Law or something on TV, you would be convicting this person almost certainly. Most people think you're guilty. Why should we believe that you're not? Because of the things that weren't looked at, um, I was convicted on absolutely no physical evidence whatsoever. They found fingerprints and footprints that were never matched to anybody that belonged to strangers. There was no DNA, no evidence on that firearm that resembled me at all. All right, we good? Yeah. Yeah, let's move along. Were you always completely faithful to Larry? Yes. There was a suggestion Yes. That you're aware of, that there was a man at mm -hmm. AA called mm -hmm. David. Mm -hmm. um, you made 160 phone calls between each other over a... After Larry's death, right after Larry's death, A few yes. weeks, yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a lot of phone calls with another man. Was he somebody you had seen prior to Larry's death? He was somebody that I met in AA. He was a very nice man. Um, there was never anything romantic or sexual between us. And right after Larry was killed, he really stepped up and held me up. 
I called him so much that it actually drove him crazy and he had to pull away from me as a friend and not be able to really help me as much as he wanted to in the beginning. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, notice there are two very different yeses happening there. There's uh, a yes that starts very soft at the start and has kind of three tonal movements in it. It kind of goes, yeah. And then there's another yes afterwards that goes, yes, which just has one up and down tonal movement to it. So they're just one word, yes, but I would like you to go back and think, is one of those yeses true and one of those yeses false? I would suggest the yes that just goes, yes, that is, that is a true answer, okay? I would suggest the, the, uh, the, the yes that goes, yeah, like that, not telling the truth there. So we can look out for this uh, along our journey through this. Uh, romantic, sexual, when that's talked about, you see her eyes narrow, and I would say you start to see anger on the face, and Piers becomes the target of anger around the idea of romantic and sexual. I think that's why, as we were all noting uh, before we came back, you start to see the blink rate of peers go up quite significantly. And I would suggest we start to see him get a little bit worried. His instinct knows he's just got targeted by her. He has said something which is triggering her and, and I, I would reckon he's starting to feel it at, at an unconscious, maybe even conscious uh, level. Um, I called him so much, it drove him crazy. Uh, he had to pull away from me as a friend. Uh, so that's kind of interesting because what she's basically saying is somebody broke up a relationship with me because they called, I called them so much. Think about in your life, you know, what would, if somebody called you so much that you had to break off your friendship with them, what might it say to you about the personality of that person, the kind of calls that you were getting? Like, what would have to happen for you in a myriad of calls for you to go, this is it, I just, I can't do this anymore. I can't be a friend anymore. Because again, this is starting to uh, give us an idea of the the character, the personality that we have here. She says, he was not able to help me as much as he wanted to in the beginning. So what she's saying is, is she's saying he didn't come up to his own muster. And by that, she's gaining superiority over him. Throughout this whole piece, what she manages to do is say that this person was less than they should be. And so in my view, I would start to, to suggest, uh, you know, with all the evidence that we've had so far, that we're seeing the personality of a malignant narcissist at this point, which is usually pretty dangerous. So again, go through all, all that we've said before, start to look at those things where instead of thinking about a victim, they're talking about themselves, they're talking about the, the, uh, the, the amount that they've suffered. Um, they'll usually be going up against authority. Nothing of authority counts anymore. It doesn't have any validity, easily uh, angered. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Scott, what have you got? All right. Um, when she first starts talking, when he asks her if, if she's seen anybody else, when she says yes, everything she talks about from that point starts getting quieter. She, she doesn't say, uh, um, were you always faithful to Larry? She doesn't say, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, she says, yes. It's very quiet. She doesn't, there's no affirmative in there. I mean, other than the word yes. Um, and then she's head nodding. and she says, yes, I never did anything like that, blah, blah, blah. It still keeps getting quieter as she goes along. She never says this guy's name. I know his last name is Nolan. I can't remember what his first name is. And she says, he was a very nice man. He always, she always refers to him as he or him. She never says his name. She just talks about how wonderful this guy was, right? And then um, she's got too many of those affirmative head nods. <clears throat> after she answers she's uh, again like goes back to what chase was saying eyebrows are up and she's like you know you get it you know or you agree with me and when she when he says is there was there anything romantic or sexual between or there's when she says there was nothing 
or there's there wasn't anything romantic or sexual between us some people are going to think that head nod again leading back to that means she's saying yes as she's saying no while she's saying no that's not what it is again it's that affirmative connection where she's making that hard eye contact those eyebrows are up and she's going there was nothing you understand what i'm saying you agree with me and again he's not agreeing with her so that's why she's coming on so hard with that i believe all right uh chase what do you got yeah, so one of the things, I'll make this short, you guys are talking about here is called psychological distancing. So we're distancing from the person and typically suspects in a crime who have committed a crime or are being deceptive are less likely, are far less likely to use the name of the person. And they're also less likely to say what the crime is. Instead of murder, they might say hurt. Instead of steal, they might say take. Instead of stab, they might say hurt. So we soften the severity of things. And in, in some cases, which you might be familiar with, instead of Monica Lewinsky, you might hear that woman. Instead of sex, you might hear sexual relations. So we tend to do this when the statement is deceptive. And that's something that we just need to keep an eye out for. And like Greg said at the beginning, uh, we're looking for clusters of these and we're looking for changes from normal behavior. And while there's no behavior for deception, change can very much show us deception and clusters of these things can, can show us deception. And I think that we're starting to see that unusual, a misunderstanding of social behavior is par for the course for this person to begin with. It's a misunderstood or, or a failure to understand normal social behavior. It's just a little bit, a little bit dialed in the wrong direction with a lot of this stuff, just in how she responds, how she speaks, how she does fake confusion uh, in, in a couple of these later videos. That's all I got. Yeah, so what I've got is if you go watch her I think you're dead on, Mark. She's got narcissism traits here. You can't miss it. She aggrandizes. Everything's larger than life. Go listen to how she describes her house and everything else. It was the Taj Mahal. Anything she says is over the top. People, all narcissists, because they're trying to fill in for that insecurity, are going to overdo everything. Interesting for her here. I, I had the same yes as great. She gave us a baseline and then failed it right afterward. And Chase, you're hitting on the baseline. Nothing we do is magical. What we're doing is looking and saying, if you always scratch your nose on the right and you scratch your nose on the left, why? That's what we do is why. We're in the why business. She does something very interesting. In this place, she always pays attention, but the minute Pierce says 160, he's using a great interrogator trick. He's slowly releasing information to see her response. And what does she do? She changes her body language. She tilts in. She has that fake concern, and she's trying to fish out, is the 160 calls something new they've found, or is this the old stuff? And the minute he says, oh, after his death, she's like, yeah, and her face lights up and her brow rises, and she goes, yeah. The other interesting piece she does here for me is she doesn't do this anywhere else in the video. There are two or three places. She doesn't illustrate at all. Watch her. Hands are down. Mark, I was thinking either she's in the grotesque plane to use your methodology or she's handcuffed. She's not handcuffed. So her hands are here. Women typically don't use their hands down here around their waist when they're talking to you. They typically are moving their hands more. Now, remember, it's a bell curve. But she, as a person, anytime she's told us a story, has not used her hands. And then suddenly he pulled away from me. That means something in this story, and we probably want to poke and find out what. I think if we were to dig in, if I were interrogating her, I'd say what happened. And the last one I'll give you, and this is a piece of that just body language that may or may not mean anything, but the minute she realizes that it's 160, her lip sinks back in. That, we all know, means she needs reassurance, and so that's a great indicator. She's like, oh, I, I think I'm in dangerous ground here. This is a good one. This is probably going to be one of the more telling ones we find aside from the 911 calls. That's what I got. All right. All right, good. Were you always completely faithful to Larry? Yes. There was a suggestion? Yes. That you're aware of, that there was a man at mm -hmm. AA called mm -hmm. David mm -hmm. um, 
You made 160 phone calls between each other over a... After Larry's death, right after Larry's death, A few yes. weeks, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a lot of phone calls with another man. Was he somebody you had seen prior to Larry's death? He was somebody that I met in AA. He was a very nice man. Um, there was never anything romantic or sexual between us. And right after Larry was killed, he really stepped up and held me up. I called him so much that it actually drove him crazy and he had to pull away from me as a friend and not be able to really help me as much as he wanted to in the beginning. Everybody good? Yeah. I'm good. Let's move on. The police found in your car a bag that had the gun that was used to kill Larry. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if you're the police, you'll be thinking, well, what's it doing in your car? I do not know how that firearm ended up in my vehicle. You know, when they found that firearm, they found it with no DNA. But Rebecca, Rebecca, you can see why the police are thinking this is all a bit odd. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody break in, kill somebody, and then actually leave the gun that they used? None of this makes much sense. I felt the same way, that there was no way to explain some of this and that it did look um, peculiar, to say the very least. But um, I had absolutely no gunshot residue on me, and I was tested that night in every aspect that I could possibly be. They took my clothes, my hair, skin scrapings. Um, they stripped me bare. Um, gunshot residue is not an easy thing to escape if you have fired a, f a firearm. And if you even walk into a room after something has been fired, you're still going to get that on your skin and on your clothes. And they found none of that. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just start with the end. Okay, <laughs> if you are going to get gunshot residue on you when you go into the room, even if you did, weren't there when it was fired, why didn't you have any on you? Did you pay somebody to do this would be my first question right there. Or did you study this enough to figure out how to take it off you? That's logic that is so skewed. This is more of that challenging and trying to get to reasonable doubt. This is the way you present evidence in court. This is not, I didn't kill the guy. This is not that kind of way. Um, she's back to this campaign of reasonable doubt. And she uses that language again. I do not know how that firearm got into my vehicle. I mean, I'm an army guy. I call things vehicle because that's what we call them my whole life. And I might call a weapon a weapon, but firearm, I wouldn't call it. Those are weird things. She's listening with fake concern. And then she's negotiating. If you watch, she's negotiating that minefield constantly down left. And then absolutely no GSR, absolutely no gunshot residue. You see her eye block at that point. She's still not illustrating when she's talking about being strip searched. Trust me. I've searched a lot of people. It's not a pleasant experience. I guarantee you, none of them just sat there and said, and then they took my clothes and they did this. They're emotional about it. They're moving there. You can see their face change because it's a, it is a visceral experience to get searched. I don't see any of that here. This is more legalese, more presentation and reasonable doubt questioning. Um, Scott, what do you got? All right. She doesn't use any contractions here. She's using the, the classic thing you teach again like chase always goes with day one the second thing they teach you is you let you you listen for contractions and when you when they don't contract as she says uh where is it i do not know where the gun came from i do not know how that firearm ended up in my vehicle again like you were saying greg distancing yourself from it she would say i don't know how that got in there like chase was saying i don't know who put that in there this is this is it's so bad and then uh she says it looked peculiar to say the least. You think? You think that's peculiar? Yeah, that that that's no. You in this situation, you're gonna. Um, it's just it's such a, it's such a mess. She can't get a hold of it. So uh, the least you can say in this situation is listen. What I would say is listen, man. Somebody set me up. You got to help me. Get somebody in here. Help. Listen to me. Listen to me. Somebody set me. When somebody says they found this stuff in your car. Somebody set me up. I didn't do it. She doesn't even go down that road. She doesn't even hint at that road. She doesn't say it wasn't me. I don't know what happened. I didn't do it. I'm telling you, to, there's none of that fast talking that, that even though it's, it's years later, there's, there's none of that that says, I didn't do it. I need some help here. If anybody watching this can help me, please do whatever it is to help me get out of here. I've been set up. That's what you would hear 
from her in this place, in this situation. Then when she, she goes on to explain that there was no DNA or gunpowder residue, all that. And she says, um, when you walk into the room, you'll get gun, you'll get, you know, the residue on you. If you just walk in the room, that's true. If you're standing there, maybe. And you walk through it like those guys. Oh, was the guy on Queer Island Straight for the and the straight guy or whatever it was, where he'd spray and then walk through it. It's something like that when you get you know, get on your clothes. I have gone to the range, and then gone to the airport later that afternoon wearing the same shoes and the same pants that I wore at the range. Now, if you don't get gun residue on your shoes and your pants at a gun range, when everybody around you is shooting, something's up. And you don't get rid of it because when I went to the airport, I got in that thing where you stand like this and they do the x-ray and they blow the wind through to make sure there are no, no explosive particles on you or anything. Nothing. I, I didn't think about it until I walked in there. I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be here all day. They're going to pull me out of here and talk. And somebody I know is going to show up and go, so what's going on, man? What are you doing? So <laughs> Remember that time situation. you told me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think she's – I don't know where she's getting that information. Maybe they told her that before they – gave her that test or whatever and as the bait question it would be any reason there would be any residue right. on your clothes or anything because we're going to go through and they probably didn't do that to her just trying to scare her, you know as trying to get her to throw up that information for him that's what i think is happening and we don't see any illustrators here either nothing she's being very guarded with what she's saying she's sort of locked down as she's talking the only thing we're seeing is mostly head movements and again, we're seeing just a hint of that thing coming on, like Mark was talking about, that that aggressive behavior where you get that that head up and the part that Chase is talking about when you're, when you're kind of like, hey, man, let's do this. Some of that stuff. We're, we're starting to see, and it gets heavier as we go along, but she's starting to get into that as he starts getting in, in a little deeper into her. So that's what I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I concur with what we see there. You know, uh, you, you, you go, the gun's mentioned, you get lip lick you get uh, distancing you get eye aversion around that what i really love about this because you know now i'm starting to see a personality here i'm getting a little bit worried so now i want to know how intelligent is this person because if they're intelligent then you know we're all in trouble so and 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 i'm seeing some intelligence now from my point of view when i talk about intelligence what i'm talking about is the ability to take something and manipulate it and turn it into something else intelligence isn't just just like understanding the data. It's being able to take the data and turn it into something usable. She does this brilliantly with, with peers here where he, he goes, um, you know, this, this makes no sense. What he's talking about when he says this makes no sense is he's saying your story makes no sense. The idea that you wouldn't have known this gun, it would just end up in your car. It makes no sense. She's brilliant. She says, yeah, Exactly. It makes no sense. And then she starts to talk about it makes no sense that the gun would show up. And well, he's saying exactly the opposite of that. But what she's done is a simple uh, repetition play of words there. Uh, you know, we, we see intelligent use of language here, which means uh, consciously and unconsciously, she's pretty smart, which again, if we do have uh, a malignant narcissist here, that can be a lot of trouble if you've got a really smart one going on because they'll be able to plan and be kind, kind of devious around you and you might be in trouble. So uh, intelligence there. Yeah. And she really does know a bit, little too much about gun residue for my, for my money. Seems to me, like you were saying there, Greg, seems like she's been on the internet around that one it knows a little bit too much there there that's what i got uh who we got left chase just me yeah so i think we're we're seeing some masterful interviewing here where pierce didn't ask her a question pierce used a statement and specifically what he used is called a provocative statement and this is part of elicitation to where if i want to discover something sensitive, the more sensitive the information is that I need as an interrogator, the less questions I should be asking. So if I go into a grocery store, I want to find out how much a person in the produce department is making, I'm better off using a statement than a question because here in westernized countries, money is taboo to talk about. 
So if I went up to this person and I said, hey, I, heard, I just read online that you guys got bumped up to $21.75 an hour. That's fantastic. And they turn around and say, no, we only make $17. I just got the income because they, you know, I triggered some need, the natural human need to correct the record. But that's a provocative statement. I made a statement that caused the person to respond. That's what Pierce is doing here. He also masterfully uses her name as if a parent were speaking to her. And it is instantaneously effective. You can even see it in her eyes. She stops talking like a, like a, a child in school who's being reprimanded. But really quickly, ask yourself, if you're, you're watching this video right now, you wake up tomorrow and there's a giant brick laying on your kitchen floor and the window's broken. Call the police. Police come by and start questioning you about it. Are you more likely to say, I have no idea how that brick got to that part of the floor or how that brick got in here? Or are you more likely to say, I have no idea who threw the brick through the window? So we're more concerned if there's something that happened that doesn't make sense. We're concerned with who, not how. We know how. It was probably a human. There's not a raccoon going out there slinging bricks through through the window. It's the who. We're concerned with the perpetrator. And we're going to see this again if someone you like is, someone you're living with is hurt. We're concerned with who. We really, really want to know who. Secondarily, we want to know how. And... Again, I'm just going to hammer this really quick, 10 seconds. Uh, uh, more, this is called a non-contracted denial. And you'll see it again in such statements as, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Just to bring that up again. Gives you more That's distance to the answer. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Police found in your car a bag that had the gun that was used to kill Larry. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if you're the police, you'll be thinking, well, what's it doing in your car? I do not know how that firearm ended up in my vehicle. You know, when they found that firearm, they found it with no DNA. But Rebecca, Rebecca, you can see why the police are thinking this is all a bit odd. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody break in, kill somebody, and then actually leave the gun that they used, none of this makes much sense. I felt the same way, that there was no way to explain some of this and that it did look um, peculiar, to say the very least. But um, I had absolutely no gunshot residue on me, and I was tested that night in every aspect that I could possibly be. They took my clothes, my hair, skin scrapings. Um, they stripped me bare. Um, gunshot residue is not an easy thing to escape if you have fired a f uh, firearm. And if you even walk into a room after something has been fired, you're still going to get that on your skin and on your clothes. And they found none of that. We good? I think my husband's been shot. My house has been burglarized. I just walked in. I don't like getting a pulse on him. I just came in from the gym. All right. Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, I'd love to go first on this one. So... I, we cover this one in the True Crime Workshop at truecrimeworkshop at the truecrimeworkshop.com. This is a great example of a person trying to tell a story when they call 911. I'm not going to I'm not going to spill my candy here and, and just go on and on and on. But when a person calls 911, they want help. They're trying to solve a problem. They're not starting their alibi. She's starting her alibi. She's starting to tell a story. Listen to the consistency. People are panicked. I'll say this. I once had a really bad horse accident. My wife could barely finish the call to get a helicopter here to pick me up. And in fact, she, she, her native language is Greek and she was shifting back and forth in languages. And this is not a panicked woman. It's not in her nature. When you're calling for somebody you love, you're certainly going to be even more panicked because you're more engaged. Listen to the story. She's going to tell you a story in this, and it's going to sound outlandish. Then go listen to a real call where somebody's calling for help for someone they love and listen to the effect of fight or flight on their brain as they turn into a cat. They respond. They answer questions. 
They ask for help. They ask for help. They ask for help. They ask for help. They don't tell you what color shoes they're wearing or what they were doing before they found them. That's storytelling. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So this is this is kind of like burying the lead. It's like, you know, why not just open with, look, uh, before I ask for help, I'd just like you to know, just came in from the gym. Uh, and like, <laughs> Because, you know, that might be some vital information that you need. And the, and the responder would go, oh, thank you for telling me that. Because what you want to do is get some of that gym equipment. And <laughs> it's like, no, like nobody needs to know that you've just come in from the gym. Well, yeah, you might want them to know if you wanted to lay the alibi down on tape right from moment one. And, and again, this for me kind of signals something of the intelligence going on here, the forethought that might be going into this, that somebody might go, you know what, if I make a, a first responder call, maybe lay down my alibi right from moment one. There is no logical reason why you need to say that you've come in from the gym. I can't think of a psychological one either where it would be resonant that you came and your psyche, your unconscious would bring up that you like, you've just come in from the, the gym. It's just plain odd and, uh, and, and a, a huge red flag. I'll leave it at that. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So you guys, you guys kind of covered it, but just as a, as a very softened example, if you get into a car accident, let's say a guy, slams on his brakes or, you know, a guy side swipes you. Then you pull over. He pulls over in front of you. And then the moment you put your car in the park, he takes off. Then you're like, well, crap, I got to call the police now. So you call the police and they say, hey, 911, now you need some help. Not a whole lot, but you need some help. You're not going to say, hey, we just went to Walmart. I got six heads of lettuce because I got a big party tomorrow. But we were driving down the freeway and somebody sideswiped me. We're, it's not going to happen. We're not going to just. We're not going to do that. We're going to ask for help because that's you know, we pay our taxes for that. We need we need help. Perfect. And it was a, it was a train wreck. I'll pass it to you, Scott. I got two big things here. Number one, and Greg talks about this in the True Crime Workshop is she projects onto the, and people will do this, they'll project onto the person you're talking to that she believes this person, she's talking to her like she's a cop. A lot of dispatchers are police officers, not all of them. You know, but what she, this woman's in the impression, she's talking to the police, call the cops. And that's the one you call, when you call 911, you get a dispatcher and she's the one that takes the information or he's the one and they get somebody to you. Usually two will do that depending on how important the situation is mm -hmm. and they get the person to you. So she's setting this up like she's actually talking to the police, like her first interaction with the police, which this is not her first interaction with the police. Also, when, when the first thing, again, like Mark was saying, the first thing out of her mouth and, and everybody as well, the first thing out of her mouth should have been help. I need some help. Get somebody over here right now. They're, they're, and they're going to be, where are you? That's going to be, the, that's going to be the question they ask. Your job at this point is to give some information, answer questions, pertinent answers to questions to help get that situation taken care of and get the help you need because you don't call unless something's wrong at that point. Now, when she calls, she's talking fast and she's all upset, but she talks so clearly. You can, you can understand every word she says most of the time that when they pick up the phone, when, when the dispatcher answers the, the call, help down, help down, you see, hear, there's this has happened. That's it. There's not, you don't know what you're going to say. And like Greg was saying, his wife was talking in Greek sometimes because that's when that's part of her old language. Her brain went to that reactive mode. I've got to give you information. I've got to give you, I was going to see, uh, I was going to Atlanta. I was going to see Greg. And on the way down there, I'm driving by this, um, as I, I saw some smoke coming out from one of the exits. <clears throat> and there's a, a fireworks place there. And next to the fireworks place, I think it, was, it had a gas station and something else. And I was going by, I, I saw that was where the smoke was coming from. And the top of this place was blowing fire out of the top of it. It was hot, but there were people out front walking around and stuff. So I hollered over at my phone and I said, <clears throat> as I'm driving along, <clears throat> I looked at the, the closest mile marker the first one i saw and i had my phone i yelled to i'm not going to say it loud 
Siri. Let's wait a minute. So if it do yours doesn't answer. And I said, call 911. And so when the lady answered the phone, when the dispatcher answered, I said, there's a fire, an exit, whatever it is. I just passed. And I rem- that's what it sounded like to me. But I, she said, what? And I thought I was being very clear, but apparently I said, blah, 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 because and, I, and it's hot. And I said, it's hot. Well, of course it'd be hot because there's a fire, you know, but if I'd been cool and said, I just passed exit 148, there's a fire on top of the building there next to the fireworks place. I'm not sure what the building is, but that's where the fire, that's what it would have sounded like what she's saying. Everything she said was clear. Everything she said was clean and you could understand all of it in a situation where when your adrenaline kicks in and that your brain goes into to what Greg calls the cat mode, it's just, you're going to start just puking out that information, get out as fast as you can. And you're not going to talk right. Even though you might be a person who thinks you're cool most of the time, you're not going to, it's, it's not going to happen, especially if it's somebody you love, you're in, you're in love with, and you've got this connection, your person on the planet and they're laying their blood everywhere. You're not, you're not going to be thinking clean or clear, Greg. Let me add one comment. Go back to the first video and listen to what she says. There was more blood than I have ever seen. Pay attention in these 911 calls. Does anybody hear her talking about blood? Wait. Throughout this video, these clips we're playing, listen for her to talk about blood. The first time you see someone shot and there's a lot of blood, it's a lot of blood, especially if you've been shot five times. And it leaves an impression. For me, if that was the number one thing that she noticed, there's more blood than she's ever seen, I would expect that to come up in a frantic 911 call. Just do. The police found in your car a bag that had the gun that was used to kill Larry. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if you're the police, you'll be thinking, well, what's it doing in your car? I do not know how that firearm ended up in my vehicle. You know, when they found that firearm, they found it with no DNA. But Rebecca, Rebecca, you can see why the police are thinking this is all a bit odd. Mm-hmm. Why would anybody break in, kill somebody, and then actually leave the gun that they used? None of this makes much sense. I felt the same way, that there was no way to explain some of this and that it did look um, peculiar to say the very least but um, I had absolutely no gunshot residue on me and I was tested that night in every aspect that I could possibly be they took my clothes my hair skin scrapings um, they stripped me bare um, gunshot residue is not an easy thing to escape if you have fired a, f- a firearm and if you even walk into a room after something has been fired you're still going to get that on your skin and on your clothes and they found none of that Okay, we good? My husband's laying in the middle of the floor and he's not moving. I don't know if he's even alive and the house has been ransacked. Please, please, hurry again. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to go straight for the hot spot on this, which is ransacked. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody else will want to talk about what a kind of odd word that is. But I'm just going to go for the inflection on it. And and it has a cultural significance, the way that's said to me. Maybe it's just me, but maybe other people remember Wacky Races. And in Wacky Races, there's a character called Penelope Pitstop, who used to be always uh, be, be uh, have the hooded claw, who would be chasing her. And, and she would kind of cry out, hey, help, hey, help. And, and there was a, an inflection <laughs> in her voice that uh, that that is is become synonymous, I believe, with a a heroine in distress, a woman in distress. And I truly think that's what she's trying to get in the word ransack, is is the music that we've now become culturally used to of this is what a woman in distress sounds like. It's literally a caricature of of that it's it's e- extraordinary uh, but 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 uh, you know google uh, wacky races or do it again mark do it again hey help hey help <laughs> <laughs> it's i used to love that show the the anthill mob oh yeah uh, yeah big dastard yeah. big dastard yeah, came on oh, came on after, banana, <laughs> after the banana after the banana splits loved it yeah it came loved on it. after the banana splits after the banana splits 
Yeah. yeah. What a show. What a great show. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I'll keep my mind's going to be simple and quick again. She's talking too, too quickly and too clearly to be talking that fast and the details. Oh, they're magnificent. She starts, that's where she starts getting into even almost minutia of what's going on here. And when she says ransacked, I think I heard ransacked in like season two of Columbo. When somebody said the house has been ransacked. This nobody talks that way. Nobody talks the way this woman's talking a lot of the time. That's I'll I'll leave it there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it definitely did sound like uh Pel Penelope pistol shots. Oh, yeah, pit stop. Pit stop. Penelope oh. pit stop. We're showing your age. <laughs> we can call her Penelope. Penelope pistol shots. <laughs> I think this is the one of the fakest nine one one calls I've ever analyzed. I I get paid to analyze nine one one calls, and this is the fakest I've ever seen. You'd do this one for free, wouldn't you? I wouldn't call this the best liar, <laughs> but I would call this the best case study for sure uh, that I've seen in a long time. I'm just going to leave it. The, the all of the concern. 100% of her concern throughout the call was about her plight, her misery, her bad experiences, her loss, her suffering. Feel pity for me. Nothing about the husband. Come save my husband because I love him. It was all about her experience. I think that was telling. And when we get when we get into the dissociation part, and when a person's capable of that type of dissociation, even though they know that they did something, there is a direct tie between childhood abuse and then uh, that person's ability to get into that dissociative state and later narcissism. There's some fantastic research on this. There's dozens of papers on this, but the best one I think is written by a, a doctor named Elizabeth Howell. I forget the university, but I think that's what we're seeing here. I'm going to fly in my face. Some kind of I think something. it was Purdue. Kevin Williams. Uh, Kevin Williams. That might Williams. have been Williams' little brother. Uh, that, I'll leave it at that. Greg? Yeah, not a whole lot to add. I hear my house has been ransacked. The my, hear those first person pronouns again. You know, when you call to tell someone your husband's been shot, your house being ransacked is probably not part of it, but it is part of her narrative about a burglary and someone took things from, if you go listen to the story, someone came in her house, went upstairs, took things, took drugs, selective drugs, uh, put things in the floor, took the firearm from a hidden place, came down, shot him, went out, put it in her car. I mean, it's just, it's a narrative that she's trying to build. So my house has been ransacked, <laughs> the word that none of us would ever use. But nothing about him, nothing about him, nothing about blood. Again, he's been shot. How do you know he's been shot? Well, there's a, a lot of blood. None of that. There's not hysteria. There's not real hysteria. Mark, you probably as an acting coach would go, oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can, we, can we take that again? Can we, <laughs> <laughs> can we do that again? Just horrible acting, just trying to get her story out. And she's been believed a lot. That's all that engagement with her face and that stuff that she's doing is what's worked for her in the past. Little kids who get swatted when they lie don't keep lying. Little kids who get away with things learn how to do the facial movement that works for them. And it etches and continually builds on that structure. And you can see it in her face. All these things she's doing are really, I can't believe you don't believe me, mom, dad, whatever. And it's all there. This is all showing exactly what she typically does. And she's telling that story and that kind of hysterical thing she's doing is probably what's worked for in the past in some other case. So no surprises. That's all I got. My husband's laying in the middle of the floor and he's not moving. I don't know if he's even alive. And her husband's been ransacked. Please, please, please. All right. We're good. They believe there was no evidence that you could have checked his pulse in the way that you said because there was no disruption to the pool of blood and there was no evidence of any blood on you whatsoever. What's your response to that? I did try to check his pulse twice and I stand by that. But uh, Rebecca, how do you explain that there wasn't a tiny DNA fragment of evidence of his blood 
on you. They found nothing on me whatsoever. How, how is all that possible? There was no blood on me. That's how it was. Um, I have no way to explain this. I'll go first on this one. Um, here we're seeing that, that, again, her head is back. She's got that throat exposed, and she's coming forward with the chest and that aggressive gesture that we talked about earlier. And her and with that attitude, oh, really? Bring it on. Let's do, let's do this. One, that whole redneck attitude toward that. And then she goes back, going back to that 30-minute window that we talked about at the very beginning. She didn't have any blood on her because she cleaned it all off. She wasn't smart enough to know that there should, if she touched him, and in this situation with all that blood, there should be something on her, something on her shoes, something on her pants, something on her hands, especially if you check for his pulse. Later, she says she checked his neck. But still, there's going to be, but I think that was later because on the on the phone call, she says, I, I don't think it's, I think it comes later. I checked for a pulse. I didn't feel anything. That would be, that's the reason she would have blood on her. And not only she that, she would touch it and it would be somewhere else. She doesn't have a speck of blood on her, nothing. That's because she didn't know that she should have a little bit of blood on her. In a situation like that, you're going to have something on you when it comes to that. Um, same thing with, in that window is when she cleaned out her fingerprints. They didn't find fingerprints, didn't find anything. Nobody's fingerprints on the gun. Nobody's DNA on the gun. So as the person breaks in and they're going to clean everything and then put it in her car, come on, man. No, that's, this is, he's talking about things that would never, ever, ever happen. Never. The worst crime writer in the world wouldn't write that. There's this wouldn't wouldn't write the way she's it's it's laid out to be. It's just it's just an impossibility. So that's what that's why there's no blood or anything on there. And she's being aggressive because she has to fight for that. If she's got any chance for parole, she's got any chance of, of coming out of there without spending the rest of her life in prison. That's one of the things she's got to fight for. So that's what I, I got there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think initially we see a failure to answer the question at all. And it starts with an explanation of evidence, the, the preponderance of evidence, which is deceptive. It's a, a tiny little brick in the deception wall that we're building here for this. And she says something here that I think is very telling. And she says, I'll stand and I stand by that. I don't know anybody. So if you found a, <laughs> if there was a pinata on the hood of your car tomorrow when you woke up and somebody questioned you about it, you're not going to say, I'm not sure how it got there. And I stand by that. I stand by that. We say stand by that for opinions or beliefs, but not facts, not things that are relevant. The wall behind me is gray, and I stand by that. I stand by that statement. It doesn't work like that. <clears throat> and Scott covered the chin for us here. But Pierce is talking about blood here, and she cannot help but see that as a positive thing for her. She actually brightens up a little bit as if Pierce is offering up, there was nothing on you whatsoever. And she, she says, that's correct. Yes, you're right. So she starts jumping on this and I think has to backpedal because she realizes this is a different conversation, a different social setting in, in this interview here with Pierce. And that's all I've got extra. Greg? Yeah. So she didn't say they didn't find any blood on me. She said they found nothing on me. Here's her credible evidence thing again. More importantly, so now I'm going to give you an interrogation lesson. Right here is where I would lean into her. When she said they found nothing on me, I'd say, wow, you you had your stuff together. And I would then start to do kind of a P and E up about, yeah, you're telling the truth and, and, and. And then I would start criticizing and needling her story because narcissists can't let you needle them. Once they think you like them, then you turn on them and you start needling them. They'll correct you every time. So an approach will work wonderful, wonderfully here. Pride and you go up. You're beautiful. You're smart. You're fast. You did all the right things. Then you turn around and start criticizing. It's a hell of an orchestration, and it they always fall for it. She's over nothing. Nothing. She could have said, you're right. You're right. If, if I were being accused of killing somebody, and I'd not done it, and you said, hey, they didn't find any blood on you. Of course not. That's it. 
move on. They found nothing, nothing. Well, then you wonder, why do you need a story that says you're in a gym so that when you're in your workout clothes after you got rid of the other stuff, ta-da. So I'm not saying that's what happened, but when I start seeing her challenge evidence, scientific, you'll keep hearing her do that as if she's a criminal, a criminologist or something. She's starting to do that courtroom approach that she wishes somebody had done and going back and saying beyond a shadow of a doubt is the important thing. Mark, what do you got? Yep. So, um, and I stand by that. Uh, they found nothing. We see that arrogance come along really, really clear. What is that arrogance about? Well, in my experience, you know, and I think Greg was speaking about that to really trigger a narcissist. You want to question their humanity, you want to question their character, or you want to question their whole reality, the facts of things. And once you start doing that, they get on the whole pretty upset and they're going to come at you in some way, or they'll just disappear. They'll go off in a, in a, in a bit of a strop with you and won't want to hang around with you. I think that's what Pierce does here. Uh, he does question her humanity, he questions her character, and he questions the whole reality of it. And she simply goes, yeah, I'm up for that fight, because she has a personality whereby she will not accept the facts, the science, anything that anybody else presents. The world has to be her way or no way at all. I'll leave it at that. They believe there was no evidence that you could have checked his pulse in the way that you said, because there was no disruption to the pool of blood, and there was no evidence of any blood on you whatsoever. What's your response to that? I did try to check his pulse twice, and I stand by that. But, uh, Rebecca, how do you explain that there wasn't a tiny DNA fragment of evidence of his blood on you. They found nothing on me whatsoever. How, how is all that possible? There was no blood on me. That's how it was. Um, I have no way to explain this. Believed, and they had expert opinion on this, that your behavior in that call was very odd, to put it mildly. I don't agree with that, and I didn't agree with the prosecution said that, that they felt that it was suspect or that they got a specialist. You know, none of that has been scientifically proven. I don't agree. Um, I was hysterical when I made that phone call. I don't really remember what I did or didn't say, but I do remember wanting to hurry up and get somebody to his aid. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I won't cover a whole lot on here because there's not a ton, but there's plenty. Uh, she's challenging expertise to the witnesses. I don't agree. So what? Of course you don't agree. Who cares? What, what validity does that have? There's no argument here. There's no fact. It's just, I don't agree. Well, good. I don't agree that I should be, you know, I should have to pay income taxes doesn't change anything. And that's her, her argument. And, and she raises her brow a couple of times in there, but she looks down her nose when she says, I don't agree, as if she's condemning the system. That's it. This is just fits more of her narcissistic personality. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Why, why not agree that it was a thought? What's, what's criminal about an odd phone call? Of course it was odd. I, my, Husband has just been killed. Do you think I'm going to act normal? Did you expect a normal call? That's something you might hear an innocent person say. Yeah, it was odd. Do you think the situation was normal at the house right then? It wasn't. And she says, I wanted to get someone to his aid in this video. I wanted to get someone to his aid which I think is extremely unusual, not to help him, not to save him, not to save his life, and definitely not mentioning his name. And it's all about her plight and her suffering and not about his. Scott? Yeah, I think what we're seeing here is chaff and redirect, to, to use Greg's words. She throws out, after he says that she just throws out a bunch of stuff and throwing stuff out everywhere like out of the back of a plane all those little flares that come out so the missiles heading up toward it go chase those instead of the plane that's what's going on there and again and like you just said chase who talks like that nobody talk i don't know anybody that sounds like a robot or a moon person somebody lives on the moon you know i was getting someone to his aid 
Nobody that's that's so rehearsed and she's so ready for that because again, I believe she knows this is what she's got the she messed up in the call and she's gone through it with her lawyer, with her attorney, and they've gone over the things that were the problems that need to be corrected, in other words. And that's what she's doing here. She's correcting that. I was so confused. I don't know what's going on. I just needed somebody to to get him some aid or to get him some help. She doesn't say get him some help, like you were saying, get him some I'm I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that. I mean you have to write that. You have to sit there and think about it and think, if I was going to write what was going to happen in an in analytical fashion, I would want to get aid to this person. As you're explaining and teaching that what needs to be done, that's what you would say. You want to do as quick as you can to make it in this phone call to get aid to the person who needs it. You could say that. Grandiose language again. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just, just too big. And then we see, um, and she sounds almost bored. As she's doing this, she said it and thought it so many times. I don't think she said it so many times. I think she's thought it a lot as she's rehearsed it uh, before she said it. What it sounds like in here is a lot different than what it sounds like coming out here. That's all I've got on that. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so she doesn't agree with the beliefs, the expert opinion, the prosecution specialists, none of that. So basically she doesn't agree with any of the structures that are being put forward to her. She's putting herself outside of the, of the social structures that are going on. And you can probably imagine the personality type that, that isn't really part of general society. They don't agree with any way that that's, that's going on. They've got their own rules, their own laws, their own way that they do things and, and, and the way the universe functions. Um, so she's not accepting of any other points of view there. And, and I think Piers has got a really riled now. And I think that because you're starting to see those eyes really widen and those bottom lids drop. So you're seeing more whites of eyes down the bottom there, um, th th which again, to Chase's point, I think starts to indicate a kind of a dislocation from the reality that others might be in. She's really setting herself aside at a emotional, uh, you know, peak at that point from where Piers is, and also setting herself aside on a societal level and the way that things function. You know, for my money, she's she's in a very very different place than most other people would be uh, in that situation. Uh, I'll leave it at that believed and they had expert opinion on this that your behavior in that call was very odd to put it mildly i don't agree with that and i didn't agree with the prosecution said that that they felt that it was suspect or that they got a specialist you know none of that has been scientifically proven i don't agree um i was hysterical when i made that phone call i don't really remember what i did or didn't say but i do remember wanting to hurry up and get somebody to his aid okay hello I love each other. This man okay. is my life. I understand, ma'am. I can't live without this man. Okay, I understand. He loves me, and I love him. And this cannot be happening. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this one doesn't take a whole lot of explanation. This is the primary reason I chose her to use in our True Crime Workshop, the True Crime Workshop course, because this is absolutely silly. When I looked at it, I just went, that's not what people say. You may say, I love him. Please help him. You don't go into, I love him. He loved me. His eyes were blue. He wore a long black jacket the first day I met him. Come on, guys. This is a storytelling exercise at this point. And I agree with you from earlier. She's sat in the back room and thought of this. And she's waiting for, she even pauses at one point. When the woman asks, it's like she's waiting for her to say something. And then she pokes in the next piece. Now, let me also say that when someone is panicked, there is no normal. So don't hear what we're saying is that when someone calls 911, there's a formula for how they respond. I did a really real world one not long ago where a woman calls and says, murder, shot, I, I don't know. And, and that's about what the call is. So it, there's no normal. There's nothing normal about this. It's adrenaline. Your brain is going to function the way your brain functions, but you're going to go out of thinking brain and cognitive brain and all these long elaborate sentences and ideas of grandiosity to very simple structure and trying to get your, your point across. And I'll leave this with, I usually say, the more complex the sentence structure is, the less likely it's true. And Love from there, that. I'll hand it to Mark. 
Yeah, so um, so I think what happens here is we get a tragic love story. I think that's what's trying to be projected here is is that um, that the the dispatcher or in her view the police and maybe she does know very well that she's being recorded right now and this will get played back. But the narrative here is is this is a tragic love story and and hopefully that will blind you as to what is obviously going on here. Um, and I think also we, we get a sense from the dispatcher there that these are not the details the dispatcher is looking for because the dispatcher is going, okay, ma'am, like, okay, can we, like, can I have your address? I think she's probably looking for, like, where, what's your address? Can we, can we get some, some people to you? This is not the information that you should be giving at this point that is expected. And it is beautifully tied up in a kind of a Romeo and Juliet uh, story here. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, who have we got next, Scott? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, mine's going to be super short. We're seeing the same, th hearing the same thing we heard before. Really fast, really confused sounding. And everything's clear as a bell. You can hear every word she's saying because she's been ready. She's had half an hour to get fired up and then send this thing in right before she's all right. She's cleaned everything up. She's good to go. She's changed clothes. She's gotten into her gym clothes and she's good to go. So that's what we're hearing. And I think this is, she probably added this on to the end. This is toward the end of the call. She started adding these things in as it goes along. Cause she thought I've got to make it look like this. I don't think she rehearsed what she was going to say. But she got fired herself up to, okay, I'm going to be in love with nothing. This is what I would say. This is what people say. She thinks this is what people say when they call 911. So that's what we're hearing. Really simple. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Uh, aside from what everybody else has said, we're also seeing a continuance of the entire call is about what's happening to her. Not, I need help. It's look at what's happening to me. And one more thing, why isn't she worried about somebody else in the house? Someone hiding in a closet, someone still being there, some kind of personal security. The Maslow's hierarchy of needs would suggest that that safety might need to come first before the social or love needs of someone else there. She's also worried about is there someone else still here at the house? So we're, it's a tendency here. We're going to see this in a few minutes to look away at this is everything that's going on with me. Here's what's going on. And anything else doesn't exist. There's no perpetrators to worry about. They're all gone. There's no nobody put this thing in my car. I don't know how it got there, but we don't talk about those people. There's nothing to worry about as far as perpetrators. These are just events, not things that humans did. Anybody notice no blood? Not once. Here we are in the call. We're further in the call. It was very important to her in her first encounter with Pierce Morgan, but no mention of blood. Mm. We love each other. This man is my life. I understand, ma'am. I can't live without this man. Okay, I understand. He loves me, and I love him. And this cannot be happening. All right. We good? Mm-hmm. Here we go. I think he's dead. I think my husband might be dead, but if you worry, maybe he's alive and you can okay, help. Okay, ma'am, we have the uh, rescue is responding right now. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, but if you hurry, maybe he's alive and you can help him. So, so, so maybe if you don't hurry the death will be your responsibility. This is the moving of responsibility to somebody else, which again is a classic trait of narcissism. It's never their fault. It's always somebody else's fault. And if there is some way to shift responsibility, they will do it. And, and I think that's what's happening here. That's all I got for you on that. Scott, what do you got? I got nothing new. It's just, we're seeing the same, the same thing again. Everything's really clear. Everything, she's talking really fast, trying to sound like she's distressed, faking distress. And I agree with Chase. This is, this is the, this is the worst one I've ever heard in my life. This is so bad. I mean, that's why it's a great example because it's overdone. It's every, it's so overdone to use for examples in training. Chase, what do you got? Same. 
Worst I've ever heard. And I think, I think he's dead is a lot different than he's not breathing. He's not responding. He's not moving. And those are the things you typically hear on the 911 calls. Yep. Agreed. If she checked his pulse, what would she say? No pulse. His heart's not beating. He's not breathing. There's a lot of blood. Not, And it's not just, I think he's dead. Might, maybe might. Those are odd words to use when someone's lying in a puddle of blood and you've checked their pulse and their heart's not beating. Those are just weird words. I mean, it, this feels a lot like I'm, I would call it controlled release. I'm giving you the pieces of the story as I want you to have them so that I can remember what I said when the police show up. That's it. Right. I mean, I think he's dead. I think my husband might be dead. But if you worry, maybe he's alive and you can okay, help. Okay, ma'am, we have the uh, rescue is responding right now. We good? Yeah. There we go. You had a relationship with a man called Alfred Nolan. That's correct. You had said to him in the middle of a big fight, I'm going to kill you like I killed Larry. I do want to back up just a little bit and tell you that they found Alfred Nolan in county jail. And he told the homicide detectives that he and I ended up in a domestic um, obscurity one night and that I said to him, I will kill you the same way that I killed Larry while I held a knife to his throat. None of that is true. That incident never took place. Um, he outweighs me and there's no way that physically I could have overpowered him like that. And that's not even to mention that my husband was shot. He was not stabbed. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I love this one. Remember I said to look for illustrators. Another man comes up and her illustrators pick up again. It's the only two times you really see illustrators is when she's talking about the man in the first one from the AA and then this boyfriend of hers. Then I love the way she immediately becomes a lawyer again and starts to discredit the witness who happens to be her boyfriend or her lover. Okay, well, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good in my world. The guy that you are saying, well, they found him in jail. This is the guy you were living with or screwing around with. Okay, that, that goes to your character immediately for me. Domestic obscurity. I don't even know what that word means in this case. Maybe someone else can enlighten me, but... Here she is using that complex language again. And then he was shot, not stabbed. There's no way I could have done this. And to add more, he was shot, not stabbed. This is all about undermining any, this is about shadow of a doubt. If she can create any little, in her mind, if she can create any little shadow of a doubt, then she's innocent. She doesn't understand that that's, because that's the way the court systems work, that's not the way this works. And so she's trying to undermine the credibility of the witness and do those other pieces. And for the life of me, I can't ever imagine saying, well, just because my best friend murdered somebody and I was hanging out with him afterwards doesn't mean that I'm a murderer. Well, it might. That's pretty incriminating when you hang out with the bad guys or you say that the person you were involved with, they went and found in jail and he told them. that, that the, the logic it takes to make that leap is not normal logic. And this goes back to the whole thing about it's somebody else's fault. I didn't do anything wrong. I just happened to pick the wrong guy or I happened to live with a man who was killed. It's, there's something going on in her head that you really want to get into. And this is where you would want to go and poke and prod. And if you're interrogating her, I'd stop right there and say, well, hold, hold on a minute. In fact, this is a guy you lived with and he's in jail for, for what? Oh, oh. That speaks volumes. And then she would have to start defending and, and, and. But you can see she's done this so many times that she's got that kind of head whipping thing going on. And she thinks she's getting that benefit of a doubt. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, domestic obscurity, or uh, she seems to say obscurity. I think she's trying to say obscurity. Uh, I think it's distancing. Um, rather than saying, you know, moment of domestic violence, you know, we were we were arguing and, and maybe, you know, getting into something, you know, pretty heavy. Uh, but also it has some grandiosity to it as well. So I think it's not only grandiose, but it's but it's distancing as well. Um, yes, put, trying to point to the credibility of the witness there. Well, they found him in jail, you know, so that is automatically trying to discount the credibility of that uh, witness. Now, here's what's really important for me. Um, my husband was shot, not stabbed. 
So we know that this is this is true. I think the evidence, and, and she would admit the evidence points to, he was shot, not stabbed. And you hear this downward intonation. So let's just suggest that when she does downward intonation, it's the truth. So she says, that's not, that's not true. And then she says, never took place uh, before all of this. And um, that he he didn't he wouldn't have she wouldn't have the weight to be able to uh, to hold him down. And again, they're all upward inflections. I would put any money you like that it's true that he was shot, not stabbed, and it's a lie that that's not true. Okay, uh, to the to those first questions of was there this altercation, <laughs> obscurity? Whatever, whatever it was, I think that definitely happened. I think she's lying when she says it didn't happen. It definitely happened. Um, now, here's what I really, really love about this uh, is the play of words that happens again, because it, it speaks to the intelligence that we have here. She plays with the idea of of like that that um, uh, you know I would kill kill this person like I killed that one. Uh, Pierce is saying um, that the outcome would be the same, that she'd said the outcome would be the same, both would be killed. She manipulates that to suggest it would be done in the same manner. Like that is a beautiful piece of intelligence, intelligent obfuscation there to use a grandiose uh, word. Brilliantly, brilliantly uh, done. You know, though she doesn't know what ob obscurity might be or obscurity might be, she certainly has some some really clever, simple word manipulations that work really well for her. Um, yeah, very, very skilled and therefore potentially quite dangerous to be around. Uh, who we got next? Scott, have we had, have we had you? Yeah. No, not yet. <clears throat> oh, okay. Chase, you go ahead and then I'll go last. Yeah, Chase, go for it. I'll just say one thing. You guys covered all the nonverbals. Despite the indicators of deception here, this is the most truthful denial that she has made throughout the entire video that you've been watching. Scott, what do you got? I wish I'd gone first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's, okay, let's talk about this, ob this obscurity that we're talking about. A dom she says a, a domestic obscurity. She's totally, like Mark said, she's totally blowing this off like it's nothing. For someone to call the cops on you for, for getting in trouble, you're inside and there's something going on. It's loud enough for somebody to go, hey, man, we need should we call the cops? And then they say, yeah, I think we should because you'll hear it for a while and then some stuff will happen and then they go, we need to do something about this because when you show up to... On. Exactly. <laughs> Because there's obscurity next door. And so what happens is when the, when the cops show up, they'll say, yeah, this has been going on for an hour or 30 minutes or something. So this isn't something small that happened for you to be loud enough, even if they're in a hotel room, you know, for you to be loud enough to have the cops called, there's a lot going on there, a whole lot going on there. So that, and this, this whole part about being obscure, it's like when we talk about studies, and they said, well, I heard so-and-so and so-and-so. And then she should go, that's just some obscure study from so from whoever it was. You know, the, what's his face from the thing over there? You're like, oh, okay, I didn't know. Because you'll hear rumors about studies about something going on in the brain. So that's, and you just blow it off like it's nothing. Some obscure study on whatever it was. That's the way you do it. That's the way she's treating this. So I'm with Mark 100% on that. It's, it's horse poop. You had a relationship with a man called Alfred Nolan. That's correct. You had said to him in the middle of a big fight, I'm going to kill you like I killed Larry. I do want to back up just a little bit and tell you that they found Alfred Nolan in county jail. And he told the homicide detectives that he and I ended up in a domestic um, obscurity one night and that I said to him, I will kill you the same way that I killed Larry while I held a knife to his throat. None of that is true. That incident never took place. Um, he outweighs me, and there's no way that physically I could have overpowered him like that. And that's not even to mention that my husband was shot. He was not stabbed. Let's move on. There was a fire that completely destroyed your home. Some of the police believe now that you were trying to make money from the insurance. 
there was no insurance on that home. That home was in foreclosure. I would not have gained monetarily whatsoever on that. That house fire was not, I don't believe that anybody set my house on fire. I certainly didn't, but I was not, um, I was not in a position to gain anything from it whatsoever and was let go. They questioned me and cleared me. Chase, what do you got? I don't believe that anyone set fire to my home. Why not? Where, why not have some perpetrators? We need some villains in this story. We need some villains in this novel. Why not? Why not give some? And this is also her saying, I don't believe anyone set fire after arson investigators, fire ins investigators, police detectives have investigated this, found accelerants. They found a part of the house that was burned more than normal. When wood burns over 800 degrees, it causes something called alligatoring. I looked this up this morning. But there's all this stuff, all this evidence, and she says, I don't believe anybody did that. Based on what? Your degree in arson investigation? or I have no idea. But when I first started out in interrogation, I read a book by John Reed and Buckley. forgot his first name. And in this book, it's, it vehemently espouses that guilty people are unwilling to eliminate people from a suspect pool but they're also unwilling to say that somebody did this for a reason. For instance, when you ask like, Mark, can you think of any reason somebody would have wanted to hurt Greg? You'd say, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, plenty, plenty of reasons. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to say that anyone did something wrong because that would cast a, a shadow over ourselves. I'll leave the uh, behavior stuff to you, Mark. Yeah, lovely. Um, okay, so I, there is something here that I absolutely believe is true. She says um, there was no insurance and um, it, that it was in, the house was in foreclosure. And therefore, if, yes, if the house was in foreclosure, the, the insurance would be null and void and, and that she wouldn't have um, got anything monetarily from it. I think that's true. Uh, insurance null and void because the house was in foreclosure she's spiteful she's not going to allow anybody anybody to get any value out of this <laughs> now, she burned the thing down because nobody's going to make any money out of this thing she's lost the house nobody's going to gain it that's what happened here and again it just reinforces look i don't have any certificates on my walls around the psychiatry of this but as greg has said before uh you know all of us here have been around enough characters uh, to know often what we're dealing with. And what we have here is for sure a malignant narcissist. And uh, with a certain amount of intelligence to be able to uh, manipulate the way that stories happen. It's not quite good enough that she can stay out of, out of prison, but it's still good enough that she's probably pretty good at telling a story to people and, you know, getting enough of a relationship to then get them involved with her so that it can all explode again and play itself out. Uh, Scott, uh, what do you got? I, I've got that book, Chase. I was trying to find it and pull it up and go, ah, I think it's Joseph. I've got I it think. right here. I'll oh, okay. It while you're, I'll get uh, it while you're talking. You they're, okay, do the recordings. If I heard his voice anywhere in this world, I would know this guy's voice. I mean, you've, you've heard it a thousand times. That guy, that voice he's got is just killer. Anyway, um, this is this is the first time we really see her chin come down and protecting her her throat. And that usually you see that when someone is at, you're telling them that they're busted, they're guilty. They start the chin starts coming down, protecting the throat, and that that's the first time we see it. So as this as this what she perceives as an attack on her starts happening, that's what she starts doing as she's explaining things. I think she, I don't think she realized this is this is where I think we're the intellectual level we're dealing with. I don't think she knew that she wouldn't get any money from burning the house down. I don't think she knew it was in foreclosure. 
Now, I would guess, I don't know for sure, but since she's been in prison, since all this stuff happened, the house payments weren't made, those, and so it went to foreclosure. But I think she thought she'd be able to get that money if it burned down while she, but maybe she did. I'm not sure if that's what happened because I think maybe I saw a picture of her at the house after it burned or while it's burning or something. But I don't think she knew that she wasn't going to get any money from it. So that's why I think she did that. So I think she's or hired somebody to do it. Um, is most likely what happened. So she's, uh, that's, that's, I, Mark got most everything. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm only going to add a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, if you ever watched the show Big Bang Theory, where Sheldon is this kind of nut job guy and he constantly says, I'm not insane. My mother had me tested. She does the same thing. Well, they questioned me and let me go. So I must be innocent. Well, no, they were waiting to get you for something else. She uses a push pull word. Anytime someone uses a word that doesn't fit the sentence, although it may fit in the sentence, it changes the meaning like monetarily. I agree with you. In this case, Mark, I think she still gained something, even if she didn't gain monetarily. And I would have said, what do you mean monetarily? And I would have poked on that ego. Finally, I'd say this. While it might not be believable to us, all that wrenching her face and doing all that stuff she's doing has worked. All we are is successful organisms is a repetition of what we've been doing since we were two. And when something fails, you know, there's a whole principle in psychology. And Mark, again, I'll say, not a psychologist, but there's a principle in psychology of extinction. If you need to reward or punish things, it falls off. Well, when you reward something, it gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. So this is work for her. She knows her clientele. She knows to work her room. Doesn't necessarily mean that it would work in our room, and it certainly doesn't. But she's figured out in her many years of doing this, and you saw her with all the makeup and all that kind of thing. She had a certain group of people who fell for whatever it was, the flutter of the eyelids and the twisting of the head and the, all that slowing down and talking and using big words. And all of that worked for her in her life to get her to, as as there's a comedian, Ron White, to get to the scene of the crash. That's how she got here. That's what I got. Excellent. So what'd you find, Chase? Joseph Buckley. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it. This is this is actually my original textbook here. And I just want to read a quick sentence here in honor of Greg Hartley. The core of behavior analysis, however, is the asking of non-investigative questions that are specifically designed to evoke behavioral responses. Page 63. Beautiful. There was a fire that completely destroyed your home. Some of the police believe now that you were trying to make money from the insurance. There was no insurance on that home. That home was in foreclosure. I would not have gained monetarily whatsoever on that. That house fire was not, I don't believe that anybody set my house on fire. I certainly didn't, but I was not, um, I was not in a position to gain anything from it whatsoever and was let go. They questioned me and cleared me. There you have it, Rebecca Fenton and in all her glory in that situation. So if you like what we're doing, please go ahead and subscribe. All right. We good? Yeah. That's one more in the can. Deal. I'll see you guys next time. I know. Help, 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 help.